episode is brought to you by Portland Distro. If you love underground music and movies, go to portlanddistro.com for licensed shirts, vinyl, CDs, and more. Go to portlanddistro.com. Plug in the discount code MikeHill666 for 15% off at portlanddistro.com. Hello, everyone. We're doing another Unholy Passion episode. I got Ralph Schmidt here on the line. How's it going, Ralph? Uh, fantastic, Mike. It's CM Punk return to wrestling confirmed day. So it's one of the best days in recent times. How are you doing? I'm doing okay, man. I actually saw that you posted something on Instagram about that. So uh, you're a big uh, wrestling fan, aren't you? Yes, I am. I know I know a lot of people that are into like fighting stuff, like are thinking wrestling is something cringeworthy, but I never saw it like as competitive fighting. For me, it's like a soap opera and uh, an artistic soap opera. But yeah, man, I've been a wrestling fan ever since I was, I don't know, nine, ten. That's when the first WWF back then matches were shown on German TV. And I just fell for it and kept watching it over time. And for me, it's just like, it's like a safe space in a way. It's sure. so, it's easy, it's easy to understand. It's always, it's giving you something positive. You know, there are people you can hate and root for, like you have the people you can root for. And now and then there are characters you can relate to or storylines and it's just fun. I mean, everybody knows it's staged, but still, I love it. And yeah, man, CM Punk was like the guy for me when he came out being my straight edge myself and like his political stance coming from the hardcore punk scene, being down with all these bands and just the way he talked, he wrestled and it was so honest and this whole story about him getting booted out of the WWE and the lawsuits and for forever people were fantasizing about him returning and now for three years there has been this new league AEW which is run by wrestlers that are also wrestling fans and they're backed by TNT so they've got good funding and they just established something that I always dreamed of it's like Everybody is welcome there. It's not like sweaty bit guys like in the WWE. It's like everybody's welcome. And now, finally, after seven years of waiting, yesterday night at uh, Rampage in Chicago, he made his return to, I don't know, it's the most thunderous return I've ever seen in all of wrestling. Not even like Hulk Hogan or The Rock stepping back in the ring got that ovation. Oh, wow. Yeah, man. Yeah, it was crazy, man. Even if you're not a wrestling fan, like this video I posted on, 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 um, on Facebook about it, just click on it and see how people lose their shit when... I mean, he, he comes out to Cult of Personality by Living Color. Oh, wow. Okay. And it's yeah, and song. just like they add, yeah, they added like this in the beginning. It's just like it's quiet because everybody knew what... Like everybody was like, okay, this is supposed to happen, but we were not... We can't believe it until we see it. And you see, like, people talk about it and people rooting CM Punk, CM Punk. And then all of a sudden it goes quiet for a brief second. And then there's this... And people just explode, man. And I sat there... I watched it this morning because I didn't want to have it spoiled through the internet. I was in bed when I got up, like, took my phone, started watching it. I jumped out of bed like I had tears in my eyes. <laughs> That's Unho awesome. I, I really, dude, I really, it's like one of the best moments I had all year. My cat ran away because she was like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> That's awesome. And man. I'm like, it's like, it, it's a 10 minute bit. And then he cuts a promo and it's so honest and heartfelt. And I'm like, yeah wrestling is real everything else is fake <laughs> that's, that's great i i fucking love it man that yeah so you can hear i had a great start to this morning man <laughs> cool that's that's good to hear man i um i don't i only know about cm punk really through um when he had his stint with the ufc as a mma fighter and um I and watched, he fucking sucked <laughs> well yeah it's a different thing man I, I i know that one's entertainment you know what i mean well they're both actually they're both entertainment you know what i mean but one yeah. of them is more competitive and the other one is like a scripted storyline yes. and um i mean i watched a bunch of documentaries with him like they had 
you know, there was, it was a big event for him to go over to MMA. So there was all this like, you know, press coverage and these little episodic videos. And he, you know, he seemed like a cool guy. Like he seemed, he was into a lot of the same stuff I'm into, you know, like the the music and comics and he wrote comics and now he's appearing in horror films and, Yes. You know, he's an actor and, and he, he seems like a pretty cool guy. I, I just don't know about his wrestling career. I don't, I wasn't really that familiar with it. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the thing. Like he, it also clicked the same boxes with me and now him being in Jacob's letter. No, it's Jacob's wife. I don't know. Like this new shutter movie. Yeah. I haven't yeah. seen yet. He's also in heels, like this new wrestling show, which is like kind of like Friday night lights with like a redneck wrestling league. Um, and yeah, man, he's just like a, such a straightforward and honest guy. And this this whole story about him, I, I like. I hope there will be like a proper documentary about his his way. Um, and it's like he came up in Ring of Honor, the small league, which is like one of the most honest things. And I mean, Jamie Getz, our mutual friend, is a huge fan of that. And then he like in this promo today, he said like he left professional wrestling in two thousand six. And then, like, then he cuts a break, and now I'm back in professional wrestling, which is like a shoot against WWE for being like this product, which is just about entertainment and not about people actually able to wrestle. And yeah, I hope at some point this whole lawsuit, the way he, the way he was treated in WWE, how he, he got fired on the day he got married. So he, yeah. So oh, it's, wow. it's it's a yeah it's it's a tough story, and he was always honest to himself. He said like I'm not interested in this anymore, and if there will be a point where I'm interested in it, like a product and a chance for me to actually do what I love, I might come back. And this is a, has people like me going for years, and it's like it's not impossible. But you think like he's the one guy that will never go back. I mean, it was the same with Mike Judge and Judge the band. Well, I always thought like they were the band that won't sell out and come back, but they did, and it was horrible. But like with him now, when he comes out, you can see like at first he's skeptical, and then he sees the reaction and see like okay, this is where my heart actually is, and I'm thankful for like being able to witness this yeah that's excellent man i like i said i i saw that i knew you were a wrestling fan and i was like that's great man ralph must be really happy about this yeah i am dude really it's, it's as, I, as i said it's one of the best moments in the last like yeah in the last years yeah well to get before we get too far along i just want to dedicate this episode to uh hollis murphy who recently passed away um, he was a huge part of the scene down in New Orleans, and um, I, for years I would see this young man at shows, and um, I was it, we just developed a friendship just because he was always around every time, uh, you know, Tombs would come through New, New Orleans. You know, sometimes he was one of five people at the show, honestly, you know, and <laughs> and uh, it meant meant a lot to me to have known him. Uh, these years and sadly I found out that he passed away Um, if anyone's interested or if they know Hollis uh, there's a GoFundMe page to help his family cover the expenses and so if anyone wants to um, offer any support I'm going to post a link to the everything went black I mean a link to the uh, GoFundMe at the everything went black Facebook page if you're interested so you know please check it out and uh, yeah Hollis is going to be very much missed in the world and um you know my, my heart goes out to his family and friends and uh this episode's dedicated to him yeah oh, man yeah I, I i saw about this i haven't met him but i heard so much about him and so many bands and people that i like i gave a shout out to him i just watched like a brief stint of a down um new orleans show stream they did yeah and phil and samuel was wearing his shirt and- oh wow damn yeah, yeah, so it's cool. Like, I, I love this about the metal scene that there's like these people that are fans and they're actually like, they can reach their favorite bands and make this connection and become like part of our lives. And yeah, so I can totally see how, how tragic it is for so many people to lose such a gentle soul as this guy must have been. Yeah, no, it's, you know, it. It, it was it was just uh, I was surprised at how how many people actually you know were, were, were knew, knew him you know everyone all those guys down in down in New Orleans like you know all those bands that 
everyone knows about support throw some support into this and it was really cool yeah so the uh anything else you've been checking out over you just you just wrapped up your uh your summer break so uh you know what what are you yeah. doing <laughs> um i mean there's a lot of stuff but i think we should get the elephant out of the room and talk about <laughs> talk about the movie that i hated the most in the recent years because <laughs> yeah we and i we had some discussions about it yeah yeah so everybody out there i don't know this might not be your opinion and i think i'm pretty much alone with my opinion but the green knight fucking sucked <laughs> it was the most it was the most gut-wrenchingly stupid thing i've seen in a while i was looking forward so much to this and I was actually like this morning in the gym thinking about this episode. I'm like, okay, I have to talk to Mike about this on the podcast. <laughs> There's, you know, there are these movies like kind of like the CM Punk thing where you're like, wait forever for something to happen. Sure. And there's like, there's these things like when Bad Boys 3 came out and I'm an unapologetic fan of Bad Boys. Bad Boys 3 was everything I wanted out of this movie. I... The same goes for, like, I'm looking forward to the new James Bond because I think the Daniel Gregg Bonds are excellent, all of them. Yeah, they are. And um, there's, like, a bunch of these things. I'm in the new Dune. I, I'm looking forward to the new Dune. The trailer looks mind-blowing. And, yeah, then there was the Green Knight when people started talking about this. I'm like, oh, man, this will be made into a movie by this director. This must, like, this will be the best thing ever. I had tickets for premiere night, went to my favorite cinema, watched it, and um, yeah, man, after 25 minutes, I thought, like, this main dude is the dumbest motherfucker ever. <laughs> it's like, how how can this dude be so stupid? This whole movie would have been over in 15 minutes if he wouldn't be such a dimwit. And then, like, everything in this movie I thought was terrible, except for, like, the graphic images. And the best acting was done by a computer animated fox. So yeah, <laughs> fight me, but fuck this movie. <laughs> I, I I didn't hate it as much as you did. I didn't. You know, I, I was um, I saw it in the movie theater as well. Um, I live I live like a like five minutes from one of those dine in like AMC theaters. So uh, you know, I always go to the matinee on a weekend when you know there's no one there. So. Um, so I got the tickets and I went, or I should say ticket, because I do everything alone <laughs> alone these days. And uh, <laughs> but the um, so I'm sitting there watching the movie. You know, there's like a million promos for other movies, which I'm like, oh man, this is like, you know, un unbelievable. The first thing that really struck me is that um, in the Arthurian legends, uh, Gawain was actually already a knight before he undertook this uh, this whole thing with the with the, with the Green Knight. And in the movie, he's just some some fuck up, basically. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that was the first thing I had a problem with. And just um, okay. Well, I know that you have to make leaps of faith when you're watching these movies, but I also like to make one major leap of faith, and then everything else makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So he's just some guy, some libertine, you know, and. He cuts the guy's head off, then the green knight's head off. And I'm just like, man, that's like kind of a bold thing with someone who doesn't have any experience with a sword to do. Okay. Yeah. And then just the whole, um, I mean, I, I know that the green knight story has more to do with like, uh, you know, like, like this kind of absurd situation and that. And um, I just thought narr narratively, it didn't, it didn't really do what it was supposed to do as a narration. Uh, huh. It, it looked great, you know. There's a small tie-in yeah. with the Giants, you know, like you know, that's, that's, that's that a was awesome. Yeah. Little tie-in here, you know. I, I saw the Giants and I was like, oh, net the Nephilim, you know, or whatever. And I was yeah. thinking, like, today we're talking about Fields of the Nephilim, so. But um, yeah, I give it like out of a five, I would give it a two. I know that you would probably give it a zero, but I give it a two out of a five. Yeah, I I really I. I hardly hate on movies that much, but I think it's it's like because I was expecting so much out of it, the the blowback was even harder. But I really I remember you know like I'm not a I'm not a hateful person. I don't really feel hate. Mostly I'm like 
disgust or something, but it's not a lot of things that I really hate besides maybe fascists. But I'm like, I'm in the movie theater. It's my favorite theater. I'm like, cool. I'm in this movie and tomorrow there's no work. So like, I'm not, I'm not tired. Um, I actually bought some popcorn and it's like, I got my sugar free Coke and I'm like, this is supposed to be good because I also go to the cinema mostly alone. And then it starts, I'm like, oh man, this will rule. And then it starts, I'm like, this guy is a handsome looking idiot. And then it's just like, oh, like, okay, this is that guy from this movie and that's that guy from that show. And then it starts and then it's like, yeah, so uh, here's the challenge, man. So you attack me, like one of you guys attack me and um, I'll give the same thing back to you next year. We'll meet at my castle, you know? I was like, oh, cool, I'll chop your head off. That would be a great idea. I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's what I mean, the logic of it, you know. Ugh. So, yeah, I'm like, okay, so, wow. I'm, I'm, I really hope they can turn it around. And they didn't. And, of course, yeah, there was the scene with the giants. and That was cool. And, as I said, like, the fox really was cool in a way. But, like, so many other things, I'm like, okay. And then, all of a sudden, like, he's there. He's at the, I mean... The fucking guy got owned by three kids in the forest 20 minutes into the movie and five minutes into his journey. You know, like he, he stripped naked, losing his fucking sword, tied to a tree like a complete victim. And it was just like, God in heaven, what a dimwit. So, yeah, this is it's a minus two on my on my. Chart. Wow, that's harsh, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I never, I never ever want to see this fucking movie again. <laughs> That's great. Are you, were you familiar with the Arthurian legend at all? Did you read any of that stuff? No, not really. No. no. Actually, if you want to, uh, Tolkien has, um, uh, there's like a, a collection that he interprets that. It's really cool. Okay, cool. The Green Knight. I, I think, I, yeah. I think the most I know about it is like from the Monty Python movie. I don't ah, even right. know what the what the what the English title of that is. It's like in Germany, it's the 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 Knights of the Coconut. I don't know what the yeah. English term for that. But it's just like that. There, of course, like here and there, in Indiana Jones, you get mentioned and you read something about it. But like, I'm not really familiar with that. Yeah, um, it's funny. I, I I thought I was like, oh, the Green Knight. You know, it's like Gawain. Like I said earlier per the legends was already part of, he'd already been knighted before the uh the green knight came down you know what i mean so that yeah. was like the big for me that was the thing i got stuck on wow <laughs> but uh, well wow man that's that's harsh but hey you know what are you gonna do that's life <laughs> yeah <laughs> anything good you saw or read or music you like oh uh, well there's there's been a bunch of stuff um most recently i actually um Actually, I saw something I didn't enjoy last night, which and I was kind of upset that I did not like it. Was uh, I saw oh. Demonic, the Neil Blomkamp uh, film? Okay, I haven't and heard about that. It's brand new, and uh, Blomkamp did District Nine, and um, uh -huh. which was which was great. Um, I love it too. Yeah. Some his other films, he did Elysium, and this other film called Chappie, which I did not see. And but what makes me more most excited about his work is uh, his Oak Studios uh, site, which is a bunch of shorts that he d he's done, which are really okay. really great, excellent. All so right. Demonic is his first feature length film in a long time, and I was like really looking forward to it. I was going to drive forty five minutes to see it in a theater last night, but I discovered that it was on Apple. It was on the um, iTunes, the movies. So mm -hmm. I just rented it for like seven bucks. And now I know why it was only $7. So it was like, <laughs> ah, it just wasn't that good, man. It was boring. The, the, maybe the premise was interesting, but it just didn't really deliver on, on any level, you know? Right. Okay. But uh, I, believe it or not, I have never read the Dark Tower series by Stephen King. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I started that a couple of days ago with The Gunslinger. Yeah, and um, and yeah, there's been a bunch of cool films. I saw, um, you know, the new, the brand new cherry flavor on uh, Netflix series. Okay, pretty good. It's like, uh, you know, a horror series takes place in the '90s. It's got like a really attractive uh, female lead, um, witchcraft, a little bit of weird fiction oh. elements in there. 
nice. very, very uh, nighttime LA vibe to it, which is cool. Kind of like Lost Highway esque in at times, you know. Cool. Yeah. 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 It's been been staying uh, staying busy and aware of like a lot of good movies. I actually just started for the first time in my life the X Files. Ah. I yeah. And it's uh, I, I, it blows my mind why I didn't continue watching it when the first season came out back then. I saw like the first few episodes and lost track. And a lot of people around me are like, "You've never seen the X Files, really?" And now it's on Disney Plus, so I started and I'm really enjoying it, man. That's why I posted the thing about uh, the guy, like the 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 the, the serial killer that can predict the future yeah. from the from the one episode. And I'm like, this had a really Twin Peaks kind of, Twin Peaks-esque kind of flair to it. And I really love it, man. And just like, it blows my mind that I haven't watched it earlier. Yeah, so. I, I love The X-Files. Um, you know, I, it, it, it hits so many boxes for me. But I got to say that I did not watch it in real time. Like I, in the okay. 90s. Because like, I, I've said this before on other episodes. And all throughout the 90s, okay. I, I did not have any kind of television. I didn't have cable TV. I, had no, I didn't even have like anything. I just had like a VCR player and like a television that wasn't connected to anything. So I, I did not see Twin Peaks when it was on TV. I did not mm. see The X-Files when it was on TV. I watched them, you know, on DVD, like towards the end of the 90s, like when, when like... Um, you can you could start renting television shows. That's when I started mm. getting into a lot of this stuff. So, you know, my my experience is a little bit different. But the X file always makes me nostalgic for that period of time, like the '90s and you know all that stuff. Yeah, that's exactly what happened here. Now I'm a, I'm a totally '90s kind of kind of thing now with like watching X Files. I watched U.S. Marshall yesterday, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, like these, like these '90 movies, and also watched um, Outbreak. And, oh yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just like seeing this. I mean, of course, it's weird seeing Kevin Spacey, um, but it's just such a great movie, and it's just like so on point when it comes to virus pandemic and and all the paranoia about it, and just like. Yeah, man. So like a lot of like this 90s stuff is really good. So I've got a like stack of DVDs I took out of the shelf just like, OK, I need to watch this, need to watch that. So, yeah, I'm also in the 90s nostalgic mood, which also fits to the band that we're talking about. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, in my opinion, definitely something from the 90s, but also very timeless, really. But real quick about the X-Files. Yeah. If you like the X-Files, are you familiar with Millennium? Yeah, we talked about this before. Yeah. It's one of those shows. And now, uh, shout out to my best friend, Danny. Here's here's the box that you click again. I can't access it because there's no streaming here. So, you know, <laughs> I have to watch it on my illegal platform. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. yeah. All right. So today we're going to talk about Fields of the Nephilim, a band that uh, both of us have uh, a deep appreciation for and have directly influenced our creative output. Absolutely, yes. Grand grandiose band. And to be honest, I thought about it this morning, and I think the last time you and I saw each other face to face was at Roadburn, yes. when uh, that whole tour fell apart almost and there was the day Oranzi Pazuzu played you guys played I went to check out another band and then it was Fields of the Nephilim on the main stage where I met you and Jacqueline like for a bunch of minutes and then you were off because you had to leave and split I think for, for getting the ferry or something and I thought like okay so it's cool that we finally talk about Fields of the Nephilim because it was the last time and I mean, how long was that ago? Like five years, six years? I don't it know. has to be. Uh, so it was probably 2015, I think, was when that happened. So yeah, it's like uh, six years ago. Seven, six or six, seven, seven years old. Yeah, almost seven. Damn. Yeah, <clears throat> that that was um, when I when I discovered that they were playing Roadburn the same day we were playing. It was like 
a time of rejoicing for me because I never thought I would ever, ever see Fields of the Nephilim. So the CM Punk feeling I had this morning. I have to be completely honest with you. <clears throat> As I was watching the set when they were playing, yeah. I actually felt like I, I was I was getting so emotional that I felt like I you know I might I might tear up a little bit. And I'm completely yeah. honest when I say that. Yeah. You know, it was especially very, esp very, very profound experience for me. Especially given the circumstances of that day. I, I felt like I thought about I, I knew how much you love this band. And I thought like after this mess of a day that you you must stand there and it's just like everything falling off of you and it's just like there's this band that I love so much and I finally see them play. So. Well, the funny thing about like Ralph Ralph is hinting at this uh, ill-fated tour that we went on with Black Anvil in Europe. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and um, it was one of the worst organized you know, tours in Europe. It was actually the last time we did a proper tour of Europe too. So we haven't been actually to tour. We've been to Europe to do festivals, but not touring for quite a while at this point. So horribly run. Um, the guy who booked the tour, <clears throat> when you mentioned his name to me, I still feel uh, a wave <clears throat> of anger and um, frustration for a, a wasted period of time that could have been utilized much better. So, uh, oh. but anyway, by the time we, um, we reached uh, Roadburn, <clears throat> I had already resigned myself to the fact that this tour was turning into just another obstacle in my life that I had to overcome. And uh, no matter what, I was gonna apply uh, a, a positive attitude towards it so I can get to the other side successfully, regardless of what that meant. And financially, what that looked like. And, you know, philosophically what the implications of that might be so yes playing roadburn in and of itself was great seeing fields of the nephilim perform really was like a huge reward for me and um you know it was great i remember i was quite busy doing uh interviews like we first got there we loaded in and then i had to sit in this room for like several hours and talk to people and and do press and stuff like that and then it was time. I made sure that I didn't have anything scheduled at all when they played. So it was like the fucking reward of a, a day of being exhausted and probably needing a shower and really needed some decent food and that kind of thing. And then I got to watch Fields of the Nephilim play. And it was like fucking amazing. Like, yeah, as, well, as far as I know, they haven't even, they've never toured the States since, since the late 80s. I think they came over here yeah. in like 1990 and they haven't been since. Yeah, I mean, they only rarely play live. By by now, I had the chance to see them six times um, ever since Roadburn, so like, which comes to one show a year pretty much. And there's there was one scheduled uh, about an hour away from Cologne last year. It has been rescheduled to this fall. I still haven't secured a ticket, but it's not sold out yet, which which is something I wonder about. But yeah, I might, might try like today doing a bit of research, listening to like a bunch of the songs again. I'm like, oh man, no, I have to, I have to get a ticket. It's like one of these bands you never know if you will see them again. And yeah. when when like COVID taught me something, it's like don't push on the chances to see something that you want to see because it might just be away by the time you get there. Yeah. That's, that's exactly the lesson I learned over these last 15, 18 months or how long it's been, is just don't wait on things. Just do it while you have the opportunity. And um, oh. yeah, with that said, <clears throat> excuse me, I may never see this band again, <laughs> you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. Which is sad to me. Yeah, but, but like, let's, let's, be, let's be honest, if, um, if like I, I won't say if like COVID is behind us because it won't like if we have a way to properly deal with Corona or uh, COVID and people are allowed to travel internationally again and shit. Like if I hear about a show fields playing somewhere cool, I'll let you know early on and you can finally come out and visit me here and we'll go to that show. That would be amazing, man. And like furthermore, too, it's like. 
the last the last time I was at Roadburn too, I thought about how much fun it would be just to go for a few days yeah. and do yes. the fest yeah. and watch all the bands and just not have to worry about playing and doing like the logistics of touring or any of that stuff and just be like in Tilburg <clears throat> for a couple of days. And um, yeah. a little aside about Tilburg, one of my favorite um, martial arts uh, figures, Boss Rutten, is from uh, Tilburg. Mm. Just uh, anyone hmm. out there who cares. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, before we start worshiping these guys, let's talk about <clears throat> the band formed in uh, 1984 in uh, Stevenage, Hertzfordshire, UK. And um, they would roughly fit into the genre of gothic rock slash gothic metal, right? Yeah. Um, not so much, psychedelic in there yeah not not so much metal but yeah. more in the gothic rock psychedelic sort of like you know world and i um, think in the in the in the hardest moments they have and i mean we would talk about various like sounds they have but i think in the hardest parts they sound like killing joke at some point being a metal band you know sure like yeah so how how did you uh, discover this band, Ralph? Like, what was your first introduction to uh, to Fields of the Nephilim? Um, like like I said, like in other podcasts, like like one of the like major um, things in my life that that like formed the person and the taste that I have now is um, when I got a mixtape. Like a, it's not a mixtape, but like an A side B side tape from a French exchange student I visited in Le Chenet, France, where, which was the partner city of like the city I come from. And he gave me a tape when I was just figuring out music. And it had uh, Alice Cooper's, uh, is it Dangerous? No, it's not Dangerous. Um, uh, the one with Poison on it. But it had like, it was just like said Alice Cooper on the A side and had Sisters of Mercy first, last and always on the B side. So that was one of my first tapes that I got with music I had no clue about. And Sisters of Mercy just like worked for me. And that was my introduction to like gothic and death, like death rock, gothic rock, all these kinds of bands. Later on, as always, I absorbed all the music I could find about this. And somewhere in this, I read something in a magazine about Fields of the Nephilim being the desert, the desert version of Sisters of Mercy. And I didn't know what to make of it. And I saw the pictures of them looking like people from a Sergio Leone movie. Yeah. And I'm like, that's interesting. <laughs> and I listened to them and I could understand why people compare them to Sisters of Mercy, but I don't think they sound like Sisters of Mercy. Oh. But that was like some some time in the early '90s that I found out about Fields. Oh. Yeah, definitely. That's probably around the time I discovered them too. Uh, back, let's all remember all all of you younger listeners. Me, like information was disseminated much slowly back then. You know, like you had to read about something in a magazine or someone had to tell you about it. There wasn't a Google. There wasn't any internet that you could just type in like like darkness or whatever and like come up with like a bunch <laughs> of bands that sound dark or whatever, you know. And um so there was two two ways that I found out about them. I there used to be a, a zine that was uh called Propaganda, which um like some of you older I know I know Retta, if you're out there listening to this, you know you know this magazine because you and I have like corresponded about it. But um, it's a uh, like a goth industrial um, mag black and white glossy magazine that came out and it was published for a number of years throughout the 90s. And that's where I found out about a lot of bands that I like, like Death in June uh, was was covered in there. Um, you know, the Coil, they would have articles about them. Oddly, oh, oddly, there was a, a Soundgarden and Guns N' Roses article in there, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think Chris Cornell might have even been on like one of the one of the covers of the magazine. Um, yeah. So there, I find Fields of the Nephilim. I'm like, oh, that's an interesting name. You know, at that time, I was just starting to read about 
like a lot of a lot of the uh, occult and like esoteric stuff was starting to leach into my reading. Uh, you know, the, my diet of books and stuff like that. Like I was reading about like, you know, reading Alistair Crowley and and getting into like uh, the process church and all that kind of stuff. And um, that name resonated with me because of, uh, you know, the, the biblical, uh, you know, Hebrew Bible um, crossover with giants and fallen angels and things like that. So I read the article, like very striking looking band. You know, they got like a very, very intense image with the Sergio Leone Western vibes like Ralph, like you mentioned, Ralph. And uh, they look like they'd ridden across the desert, you know, on horseback. These like yeah. dark figures like against the desert sun, you know, kind of thing. And um, so then I hadn't actually heard the music yet. A few weeks later, after reading that magazine, I picked up uh, a, a sci-fi horror movie called Hardware by uh, mm -hmm. Richard Stanley. And mm -hmm. anyone who's listened to me talk about horror films, I'm a huge fan of the work of Richard Stanley. And like, I know that right now he's, uh, he's been canceled, you know, and all this stuff. And it's unfortunate because I feel like he is a, a true visionary within horror and weird fiction and all that sort of stuff. And it's, it makes me, it broke my heart to hear that something happened that, that was controversial around him. So anyway, Hardware was a film that actually featured the singer Carl McCoy in the begin opening credits. So I'm watching this movie, and there's a desert scene, and I see this guy dressed. What I thought, I'm like, oh, this guy's dressed like that band that I just saw, <laughs> that I just read about. <laughs> you know, I just read about this band, and here it is this guy. It turns out I find out that he actually has a connection with Richard Stanley. Richard had had done a bunch of videos for them at some point which I eventually saw and that huh. his character, his character was really brief. It was like a cameo pretty much, but that's what got me interested in the band. And that's when I started finding their music as a result of those two, one, a movie and then a magazine. And I feel like fields of the Nephilim appeared quite a bit in, um, in propaganda. And yes, they did mm -hmm. compare them to uh, fields of the Nephilim. I believe in one of the interviews I read with Carl McCoy, he addressed that. <laughs> and he actually was <laughs> like talking about uh, basically saying like, I don't see how we're compared to them because Sisters of Mercy are like a dance band and we're not that. We're something different. Yeah. You know? That's just like, I mean, the, the comparison is like wearing sunglasses, having like a croony voice and picking guitars, but there's that's just three things you can do a whole lot with that, you know? Yeah, no, and, definitely. Uh, I mean, I can, of course, like, but I can see people loving the sisters, loving feels, but it's totally like still totally different bands. But what, what I think with both bands, um, I mean, we talked about stuff like this before. I'm, I'm a fan when bands have their shit together. And I don't mean like being punctual at shows. I love that too. Um, but like if a band puts, puts emphasis like on how the way they are presented as a band, the live show, the lights, the logo, the sound, the lyrics, and there are just a few bands that nail all the boxes. And, you know, and there's like, we talked about Breach's Collapse, yeah. you know, one of our like mutual favorite records of all times. And it has one of the dumbest artworks of all times. It's, it's, it's a gray, gray cover with a linen drawing of an airplane going down, which is like, why? I don't see it. Um, I don't know, like, I can't imagine any other artwork, but it's just like back then I thought like, this is such a weird artwork. But for Fields, one of the most striking things is their logo. Like, it's this instantly recognizable logo, more than any black metal logo. And uh, then, you, then you open up Pandora's box when you dive into them, and you see, like, the way they sound. Carl McCoy sings about it. And like you said, like, being into Alastair Crowley, the occult, that's exactly what they deal with. It's, I mean, Sisters of Mercy is like a heartbreak band, like a classic dark emotional band and fields is just like fucking bleak and dark 
And that's why I think a lot of black metal people, let's say it's one of these few consensus bands that even the most diehard black metal people that make love to Burzum and they snuggle to Mayhem, they will they will accept uh, Fields of the Nephilim as like one of the few true bands outside of metal. Yeah, uh, Carl McCoy actually was on uh, that Watain record. Um, he had a guest. Oh, yeah, uh, right. Yeah, uh, Rivers of the Wy Asia. Wyatt Hunt. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, there you go. And I know that I've seen video footage of him performing on stage with uh, with Behemoth and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, I, I prior to my discovery of them, you know, like goth music, I was thinking of a, like, you know, like the cure. Like, I know the cure, like this huge major thing now, but like in the 80s, you know, in the 80s, when I was in high school, like Susie and the Banshees, Joy Division, Bauhaus. Um, hmm. You know, The Cure. Uh, those were generally the bands that all the goth kids, the, the two or three goth kids in school listened to, one of which was uh, uh, my girlfriend at the time when I was in high school, you know. And mm. and uh, that's that was my um, exposure to goth music, you know what I mean, Was were, were those bands. And I was like, this is really cool. Joy Division, you know, loosely in that realm, they were something different, really, you know. Yeah. Uh, but... That was the band that I thought was was the one I gravitated more because of the heaviness of the lyrics. You know what I mean? And then yeah. when I heard Fields in the '90s, though they were they came, you know, they were formed around the same time in like '84. But mm. really, I discovered them in the '90s. That put them in a different realm for me because of the lyrical content and just the music itself was more rock like rock like you can tell the band had like a like a heaviness to the sound too yeah you know that's and what really got me really yeah and it's it's they have a heavy like even in the not so heavy records they sound heavy but in a different way yeah and for me like in the 90s when i stumbled like uh, about a bunch of these bands that was the phase when they sounded like this i i it could be that actually like one of the first things I actually heard was the zoo records. Wow. Um, okay. W which is, uh, I don't know, man. It's, it's like, I just remember in my book, the name fields of the Nephilim was, um, was this heavy guitar band. And I'm like, I wasn't super into this sugar chicka guitar kind of stuff. And killing joke were the same thing to me because when they like when i first found out about killing joke it was the pandemonium record and right it had like this this 90s industrial kind of stubbornness to it <clears throat> and then i later on when i found out about like how these bands sounded in the beginning and this goes for fields as well as for um for killing joke i like that stuff better but it took me some time, <clears throat> excuse me, to um, to appreciate the heavier stuff. And nowadays, I love it. And I mean, for me, they all sound like they've been inspired by Godflesh, a band that we also both really like. Yes. Yeah, I, I actually <coughs> heard the um, the first stuff I heard by them was the Elysium record, you know, which I mm -hmm. think that came out in '90. And uh, what's notable about that record is um, David Gilmour had a hand in the production of that record. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's the, of course, David Gilmore is from Pink Floyd. And that has like probably one of the greatest like pop songs ever written on it for her light. And, yes. uh, and I was like, oh, this is great, man. This is like really cool. Like I, I dug like the, the catchiness of the song, you know, but there's it's just dark. Like his voice, his voice has this, this like gravelly, like intensity to it, you know? And, uh, yeah. but the Zune record, it's funny because, um, that's the record that ever, that's Zune though, technically is not a Fields of the Nephilim record. Yes. Right. It's like more like Carl McCoy's solo work. It's called the Nephilim. Right. But they play the, some of those tracks actually are played live. Like there's some like ceremonies, like the live Fields record that came out years later. Yes. Some of the tracks from that record appear on that with the band playing it. You know, so it's yeah. six of one, half dozen of the other, I guess. Initially, yeah. no one liked that record. I remember people like a lot of my friends who are like all about this style of music were like, oh, it's their like, you know, ministry, like ripoff or whatever. 
Oh. And I, I got to be honest, I I like that record more than any ministry album I have. So, uh, <laughs> so it's to me also that it really grew on me. And, and some of my favorite tracks are actually on Zune. You know. Yeah, it's a it's a f- fucking great record. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, the story about like the, the split they did, and then like him him starting this, and then then the have you ever heard this other band Rubicon? Like the the rest of the guys that did Rubicon. Yeah, they have two albums out, and um, I yeah. only heard one. I've only heard yeah. one of their records, and uh, and it's um, it. You know, it's uh, the, the the only record I heard by them is the uh, "What Starts Ends." Mm-hmm. And apparently, there's another album that they did, but that one record is like you can obviously tell that they need Carl McCoy to front the band, in my opinion. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, it's cool, but it's was not my, anything, not in anything like Fields of Nephilim. Yeah, it was also it's also my feeling, but yeah, I mean the the Nephilim like this Zune record kind of pushed to where this band has gone and uh i mean there was this illegal record fallen which was just like a compilation and they had didn't have the right to like to release it and um but then in, like in 2005 when morning sun came out and now uh, by that time i was already a fan of the band i'm like okay this, this is a great blend of everything they did prior to uh to the zoom record but also incorporating this heaviness and sound they had there Oh. You know, it's funny, like they, they threaten new material, you know, yet there's nothing new that came has come yeah. out so far by these guys. I think the last time they were like really active as far as like, like, you know, releasing material was like 2008 or something like that, I believe. It's, uh, the, the Prophecy 7 Inch came out in 2016, I think. Right, the but, two new songs, but yeah. that that besides that, as far as like full lengths or EPs or anything like yeah, that, yeah, yeah, right, right. Like the yeah. prophecy was just like a little taste of yeah. like a, a tease. But what I yeah. I really would love to know why they haven't released any new material because I, I enjoyed that prophecy seven inch. Yes, me too. But I think just like I think they really say there is no rush. Like we will play one or two shows now and then they and I think they love to play Germany. I mean, the last time I saw them was in the Netherlands. Um, and that's the the big advantage of living in Cologne that you're like in an hour, you're in Belgium or the Netherlands. And um, so the next time they play, which will also be like an hour away from me in Bochum. Um, so there's this chance and I think they're just like they have plenty of other things to do and now and then they're like okay let's do this but I don't think they feel forced to do anything and <clears throat> I'm I, I can hold my breath you know like yeah. I I can wait and I I hope there will be new stuff and I think it will be great and I I would would dread if Sisters of Mercy ever try to record something new because like when we do this comparison I mean, I haven't seen Sisters of Mercy live ever, but I've seen like streams of the recent shows, and it's just an abomination to see that. It's just so fucking uncool. And the sister, and like Fields of the Nephilim, big advantage with wearing hats and sunglasses. You can wear a wig if your hair falls out. I don't know, <laughs> but it just they they still look fucking amazing. Oh, yeah. dude, when we saw them at 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 uh, Roadburn, man, Carl McCoy looked awesome. I saw him backstage yeah. too, man. He just looks great, you know. The guy's like probably oh. at least sixty, I imagine, you know. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, I mean the the one of the the coolest thing was um, I think we talked about this too. There's this festival here also n- not not about an hour away from Cologne called the New Waves Day. It's a one day festival. They started a bunch of years ago and has been canceled like two times now because of COVID. But the last time I went there, no, the, 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 not the last one, the one before that, it was Fields of the Nephilim headlining. It had the Damned, the Chameleons, um, uh, Crook Shadows, and, and some other, like it was a, a fantastic festival with just great bands. And then Fields came out to a raucous crowd of old goths and post-punk fans and they played like the slowest heaviest set i've ever seen them play wow. it was like it was super delayed it was already really late and i was high on seeing the chameleons the first time and um then they played like this 
almost like a doom set and it was so i'm like this band they can do whatever the fuck they want and they will always rule that's awesome man and that just speaks <laughs> to like uh them playing a show uh, like a festival with like the chameleons and then they played a festival with like all these metal bands and stuff you know yes, what i mean yes and, yes yeah and i think they played roadburn oh, not roadburn not well they you know they did play roadburn but i think they played hellfest one year that like kiss was the headliner yeah yeah, so that's how versatile and how widespread their fan base is. Yeah, and I can understand why so many people are into them. It's just like the sound speaks to to so many fans of so many musical aspects of dark music. Um, yeah, I, I just wonder, like, in comparison to the sisters, like, they're not a big band, you know, but they have, like, a diehard fan base. Also, it's because of, um, though their music is very catchy, there's an unaccessible element to it because I think of, um, you know, the songs that have like, uh, like, like, like choruses that are, are catchy or a little bit few and far between, but yeah. the, the, the heaviness of the music, the lyrical content, um, the kind of like, uh, aggressive, like like uh image of the band you know yeah. it, it doesn't really translate to big sales with respect to like sisters of mercy you know what i mean like you know sisters have this kind of sexy like like look you know like patricia um the lady who played in oh. the gun club yeah, she yeah. Was, patricia morrison you know she was in the yes. band for a while with her like gloves and everything you know and wow. You won't see that with Fields of the Nephilim. You see these like imposing guys with like these dusters and hats and just big ominous look to them. You know what I mean? It's like I think that yeah. and also they don't they're not consistently they they weren't consistent with their output. You know, like they would they were yeah. there were long breaks between records being released, you know, and, and yeah. I don't, they only toured the United States just this one time, I, as far as I know, back in like 89, 90. So yeah. they weren't like playing shows in the States really. So that's probably why they never got to be huge. Yeah, there's, there's, they're too edgy in, in a lot of stuff they do from the sound and everything. There's also just like Carl McCoy's voice. If you like, if you compare them, I mean, let's let's keep it with the theme of like sisters and them. If you like, Andrew Eldridge's voice is soothing and it's just like comforting in his dark in his dark tone, but like he like Carl McCoy is like this wolfish kind of mumbling with the rough rough sounds and the vowels that he produces, and it's not as accessible as like you can't sing along like like. For example, if you sing along Walk Away by the Sisters, that's easy. But um, Moonchild, it's just like you can sing along to Moon, Moonchild, but it's not in the way that you can sing to any sister's song. Uh, yeah, you're right. And, and if I were, you know, like even speaking to that too, um, you know, Sisters of Mercy when I was like 17 or whatever, 18 years old, like all, all these all these girls I knew were were like into Sisters of Mercy and thinking that this is like the darkest like thing, you know, like yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. into like vampirism and sisters of mercy and all this stuff. But the, the fields of the Nephilim, but you know, at the end of the day, the sisters music was about love and relationships and having your heart broken yeah. and all that. And then you get fields of the Nephilim where the lyrics are about like Sumerian gods and like, you know, it's, there just isn't, yeah. isn't that, emotional connection to young people that yeah. would have allowed them to become like these superstars you know yeah it's comparable to like I, one of the like you know when we talked about doing this podcast and i always like propose this idea of like giving us each other challenges to decide either or i like one of the first questions i wanted to ask you which i know the answer to is like vampires or werewolves and i think if you compare it Sisters of Mercy are like the vampires. They're romantic, they're gentle, tender, and like dark. And fields are rough. They're like wolves, you know? Like yeah, they're totally. more aggressive. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was, you know the answer. My, my answer would be werewolves. Yeah, yeah, werewolves. of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually a really good comparison. 
Yeah, sisters yeah. are are the vampires, and, and Nephilim are the werewolves. Great, I love yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> In preparation for this episode, I was like, you know, going through a lot of the records and listening to a bunch of stuff, and um, yeah. I kind of like compiled like uh, a recommendation list for some people um, as far as like if you are. Um, not familiar with this band and it sounds interesting to you because I, I acknowledge that they're not a, a household name, especially yeah. with some of the people that might be listening to the show. Um, you know, my, my two recommendations, or I, have a, I have a couple of recommendations of where to start with this band. And, um, you know, they, they actually have a fairly limited catalog, but I would say if you want to get really good examples of what they sound like, the three records would be Elysium, The Nephilim, and Zune. I think those are like great entry points into what this band is all about. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. You know, some of the other stuff is cool. Like, uh, there's a live album called uh, Ceremony, Ceremonies, yeah. spelled C E R A M O N I E S, which is a uh, live. There's a video that accompanies that too, and that's uh, basically cut from two nights at London's O2 Arena, and uh, yeah, that's got some great versions of some of the songs that are on Zune, which uh, technically is not a Fields of the Nephilim record, and yes. but that's the interpretations of the band playing some of that material, and uh, yeah. so yeah, would you add to that? You got anything you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I can only uh, vouch for the Morning Sun record of 2005 because it's like if you went through the three records Mike just told you about, which definitely are the best ones to access this band. And I think like if you start somewhere, start with a Nephilim, um, the, the record, the Nephilim from 88, because it's like pretty much the, the hit record they had. And Elysium after that is a bit more... Um, psychedelic but also more clean in the production and the zoom record is a really heavy record but it gives you a great overview of these three but if you dig it then you should continue with morning sun and i mean dawn razor being their debut is great um there's not much you can do wrong because i think they always kept their trades and what they do with the vocals and the picking guitars and everything but um there are some like like songs, I think. Let's talk about like our maybe our favorite songs. Oh, and yeah. I think okay. what, what an idea I wanted to pitch to you was um, I don't know. Do you do you actually use Spotify? I don't think you do, right? No, I I, uh, I use uh, Apple Music actually. Okay. Um, can you compile playlists there? I yes. guess if you yes, can. You can. Right? Yep. Because I always do playlists um, on on Spotify. Uh, I don't know, like, at some point you should start, like, an Everything Went Black, like, playlist where you just enter, like, two or three tracks of the bands that you talk about. Also, like, when you talk to Randy or the band you, your guests are from, so you have, like, a compendium of bands that are revolve around Everything Went Black. That's a and, great idea, actually. I think I'm going to do that with this episode. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. cool. Um, and so, you know, like a, like a bunch of like web things do this now that they have like playlists cur curated by acts they interview or like to have like this ever growing playlist of bands and people can just shuffle through it and it's like, oh, cool, this sounds nice. I go back to that episode. Um, and I thought about like, OK, what what would you like? I don't know if you're like how familiar you are with like specific songs, but if you would like put together a playlist for someone who doesn't know Fields of the Nephilim, which songs would do you think should be on there? You know, it's uh, it's funny you mention that because I just happen to have a list of songs in front of me. Huh. <laughs> huh. I know you so well, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a list as well? No, of course, my friend. Well, of let's, course. Let's run through our list then. I, I mean, I think if if someone were to start with Fields, you should start with the Fields of the Nephilim song, in my opinion, which is Moonchild. It it's their definitely definite biggest hit, followed by For Her Light. Um for me, last exit for the lost. Uh, New Gold Dawn, Love Under Will, Blue Water, 
Court of Souls, and uh, we covered it with Ulfa. I think my favorite um, song of Fields of Nephilim is uh, Vet for the Insane. That's great. I, I actually wanted to talk about the Ulfa track. Uh, maybe we could do that after this. All right. Yeah. Um, some of the ones that you mentioned are on my list. So uh, obviously, uh, I'm, For Her Light off of Elysium is uh, that, that, that pairing of For Her Light at the Gates of Silent Memory. Yeah. Great, great, like one-two yes. punch from them. Uh, Summerland, also off of Elysium. I, I really, lo really love that song. Um, just the dreamy quality to it. And then um, we go to Zune for Zune, part three, Wake World. Like that song, yeah. in some ways, like I felt like that, the essence of that song could have been propelled into like a, almost like a commercial version of the band. You know what I mean? Yes. Because it has yeah. this kind of like mid-tempo, like, like heavy metal guitar thing going on. And um, that has like a, like a hummable, memorable chorus uh but you know that it, it just existed in that space and that's cool and that song actually appears on ceremonies the live record mm. uh straight to the light off of morning sun uh great great song that also is on uh the ceremonies too and the version on ceremonies is like actually the preferred version of the song for me mm. um i also have moon child which i do believe is almost like their anthem in some ways yes know? No. Uh, Last Exit for the Lost and Un Love Under Will. And I, th I think Love Under Will was the song you'd mentioned as well, right? Yes, right. Yeah. And that's th that's my uh, my hit part. list there, you know? Yeah. I think it, it, we should include, like, also they have one of the best live intro. Like, I whatever I saw them, they always played. And now let me not butcher this name. Endemoniada. Endemonia or whatever that means. That's mostly their opening track, and it's just like picking up slowly, growing faster, and people are then into it, like building piles of people. They have like this classic thing going live with like that also a lot of these 80s post-punk bands like New Model Army have it, um, uh, Sisters have it, and a bunch of other bands I saw where they... People stand on the shoulders of the person in front of them. Oh, yeah, the mission always have that, too. And people, like, building this pyramids of people in the crowd. And then the, the top people are, they're waving their arms and gestures that are always kind of, it looks like they're, I don't know, like like rowing a boat or something. Yeah. And they're Im imitating the... The words they say, that's especially like with New Model Army. If, they, if he sings about rain, they will make a rain gesture. It's kind of pathetic, but cool at the same time. <laughs> <clears throat> but like when they play and Moniada, uh, I don't know, teach me, somebody teach me to how to pronounce this name. Um, it's always great. It's like they start and you know what you're in for, and it's always a treat to see them live. Yeah, yeah that's. Uh... It's funny that you mentioned seeing them live because, like, the one time that I saw them live was at in in Holland, and yeah. um, anyone in the states here has never traveled to to Holland will realize that the Dutch are big fucking people, man. <laughs> like, I was like, normally at a show in the states, I'm like uh, one of the taller people there, and I'm I'm just about six feet tall, and uh, there's some big Dutch motherfuckers at this show man and i was like huh i can't I, i'm having trouble seeing the stage man you know and then they, then that was like i was like blown away by how small i felt at that show <laughs> i mean uh, i i i can't say that i ever have to complain about this being yeah. taller than most people i mean i'm i'm six six so yeah. um I always have a great view, but people hate on me. <laughs> and like the, the general thing will be that I'm the guy that like the support band is done. I don't need to run to grab a beer. So I already took my piss, had my, dr my, 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 my drink. And then I go to like a position that is fairly okay to say for a big person like me, a tall person. Um, so then I wait, I stick around th at the same spot for like 30 to 40 to 50 minutes sometimes standing in one place waiting for the band to come 
And then the band starts to play, and then these idiots that were outside drinking, smoking, they, they push their way inside, and then they complain, like, oh, why does the big guy have to stand in front of the stage? I'm like, motherfucker, I've been here for like an hour. <laughs> Fuck you. And I'm, I'm not one of the people that stands in the middle of the front row, but it's just like I'm, 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 um, I'm being discriminated for being tall. I have to... I have to call in the woke movement to like clean clean my uh, my space at the show. We should yeah. start another pronoun for people who are uh, above six feet tall. I think. Uh, isn't there already like giant or god? I don't know. Nephilim. <laughs> Nephilim. <laughs> yeah. Well, I may, maybe I'm a bastard of an angel and a human being. Could you be. you have to you have to decide. You know me. <laughs> <laughs> Another another real quick aside about live performances of this these guys in the United States. It's like like I said, to my knowledge, and if anyone out there knows otherwise, they've only been on tour in the states once, like in way back eighty nine ninety. But uh, my for my good friend Ron uh, Martinez, who is uh, the uh, you know, the owner operator of Crawl Space Booking, who uh, you know used to work with Ron for Booking Tombs, he organized a show on that tour in um out in california and uh the the bill featured sound garden and fields of the nephilim oh man and that that would have been like the louder than love era of sound garden and fields of the nephilim pretty cool oh, right well, damn wow i mean i've never seen sound garden live and especially like around that time i would have loved to see them man that would have been an interesting show, I think, man, you know, and, uh, yeah. you know, it's just fucking cool that something like that happened. But it's also, it goes back to our Soundgarden episode when we did research for that or like Faith or More that, um, a lot of these cats had like these kind of bands as a, like a role model when they started out. And I remember that like Fields of the Nef uh, Faith No More with Roddy Bottom, he was a big goth guy. When he started out and um also like with soundgarden when they started they loved like the, the the darker side of rock music so i assume that they they were fans of fields of the nephilim and were glad to play with them yeah totally i think it was um i might have seen a uh some kind, one of these documentaries about the seattle music scene and huh. it was like i want to say it was maybe something about mother love bone where they, maybe the per, the PJ twenty the Pearl Jam documentary. It, it was probably that. Like I'm not a fan yeah. of Pearl Jams, but I watched the the documentary because I you know I'm interested. Like I don't I just don't yeah. like their music. Like I think yeah. the guys are pretty cool or whatever. And I a big Green River fan. I love Mother Love Bone. And there was um a show with actually Mother Love Bone supporting the cult actually. And I always thought that was really yeah. cool. That would have been a great show yeah. to go to too. Yeah, and it's also funny, like, if you see how the cult evolved from, like, this dark, gothy kind of band or post-punk into the straight-up rock band they became with Electric Circus and shit. And that's more in the vein of Mother Love Bone then. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they definitely took a cue from that development in music. And, like, I guess, like, some days I think about Fields of the Nephilim and, like, imagining that they could have been as big as the cult at some point, you know? Yeah. But, they, but again, yeah, I think way, way better Ian, band. Ian, yeah, it's also like again, I think the vocals of like the lyrics and also the vocal performance, it would never be as accessible as. I mean, look at Killing Joke. They they got quite big, but they got big when when uh, uh, when the vocals changed. You know, like the barking stuff where where uh, jazz is really like barking the vocals that's not the stuff that is super popular in the mainstream media but like with the um love like blood and the brighter than a thousand suns record they grew immensely big but that was jazz just singing cleanly and i think if fields had continued like doing the more melodic stuff and carl's voice would it wouldn't have been as rasp maybe they could have been bigger but I mean, the cult in comparison with Ian Asbury, he has like a great, tender rock voice. That's true. Yeah. That's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Another yeah. another comparison to Killing Joke is uh, Jazz Coleman's uh, interest in the occult too, which is like yes. similar to Carl McCoy's uh, interest in uh, in uh, Thelema. So yeah, uh, yeah. 
So what's what's the story behind your uh, the the Ulta cover of uh, Fields of Nephilim? Let's talk about that a little bit. I want I never really knew what was behind that that track. Yeah. So um, going back to the beginning of Ulta, like we recorded the first demo and then the first record came out, and um, by that time. This record made its rounds. People loved it, and I um, mean, we talked about it before. We're like one of the, like two of the nicest people in this whole um, scene, like for lack of a better term, that I ever met were uh, were Sean and Megan of Cult Nation. Yes, and and um, they've been huge fans of Planks and featured me there with Planks, and I. Like as as I mentioned before, I wrote articles for them. We interviewed each other for that, and yep. um, uh, Sean like dropped me an email. Said they have these. Um, they they did projects where they had bands cover whole records of other bands, but each like, for example, they covered here nothing, see nothing of discharge. And every song was covered by a different band. And then they released it as a Cult Nation exclusive something. And um, that feature, like the Hear Nothing, See Nothing thing, featured friends of ours called Unru. And um, I spoke to Sean about it and said, that's fucking awesome. And, and he said, like, dude, we're, the next thing we're doing is the first Bathory record. Does, do you think Ulta might be interested in doing a cover? I'm like, hell yeah, we'll do that. So we prepared the battery cover um, and um, recorded this together with the two tracks of the Dismal Ruins EP, where we also covered Mighty Spinster, uh, Spinter. And that, um, that compilation of the first battery record being covered for Cult Nation also had a band from Germany, would, they are from close around here, called Morast, a band, I don't, did I ever mention them to you? Yeah. To check them out? Yeah. Yeah. Be because I think that m must be right up your alley. It and, is. Um, <clears throat> and they covered uh, they covered a Bathory song too. We ended up playing a festival together and we said like, we hung out and like struck us for chord with each other. And we said like, why not? These, these two songs are fucking good. Why not do like a split cover seven inch? Nice. Which is a, like, it's a, in the first place you're like, who the fuck needs a split cover seven inch? But then these tracks were recorded anyhow. And mm. Stefan of Vendetta Records, we asked him, he's like, of course I'll release it. We did it and it turned out great. People loved that split seven inch. And we thought about at some point we have to do this again. And we bounced a lot of ideas of, of uh, things we wanted to cover. And we ended up because they're as well as we are big fans of Fields of the Nephilim. And um, at first we said like just tracks from Dawn Razor, but then we snuck Fat for the Insane because, like I said, it's my all-time favorite field song. And they were like, "Oh no, shit, we wanted to do that too." And then they decided to go for Blue Water. Oh, and okay. yeah, so so they covered Blue Water, and we covered um, we covered Vet for the Insane, which we recorded again together with two songs for the Belong EP we did. Um, again, did the seven inch. The artwork uh, was also like with the battery thing, kind of like the same look we we opted for, and um, yeah, it turned out great. And again, people loved it. And we always had had ideas for maybe doing a third part or fourth part of this split, but that's the story of how we ended up covering Fields of the Nephilim. That's pretty cool. Like I knew of the existence of these things, I just didn't know what the whole timeline and everything was. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's always like we, whenever we have the chance to to do something um, like this, it's always cool to have. Uh, you know, like it, it, it helps you record, like adjust the sound when you record the next stuff. You know better what you want to do. And so, we'll ever, when we have the chance to take it, um, yeah. And also, since Andy, our keyboard player, has his own studio, it was always fairly easy to do that. Yeah. That's great that we live in a world where, where we can actually do a lot of the recording on our own, too, man, these days. Yeah. You know, that's, uh, that's a huge, huge plus in this. Uh, society that normally I'm very down on technology, but that's something yeah. that's really cool though. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, man. So we haven't covered any of their songs, but there have been a huge, I mean, anyone out there who's familiar with tombs, if you listen to our last album, there's uh, Fields of the Nephilim influences all over the record. And, you know, that's one of my goals with the band is to be like this kind of like, it's like a cross between Fields of the Nephilim and like Waking the Cadaver or something like that. You know, that's that's always been like <laughs> somewhere between there is like what I want our music to sound like. <laughs> I mean, seeing, knowing you for so long and the bands you've been involved with from Anodyne or Versona to to this and uh, didn't you have a brief stint in Ten Yard Fight as well? <laughs> no, no. Um, I, I yeah. was asked to do a tour with them, but I, I declined. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so no but like uh, all joking aside i i mean i saw the progression you did vocally over the years and i mean i i don't know when it started but um i think that that ep where you were still a five piece with fade and the other guys yeah that's where where i really heard like okay so he's he's practicing his Carl McCoy kind of clean singing voice and you got better and better with it. It features on the, on the latest record and you, yeah, I mean, you can really hear the influence and you're, but you're making it your own. So it doesn't sound like, Oh, he wants to be Carl McCoy really hard, but like the way he sings and intonates you, you kind of have the hang of it. And I always love when you do this in the tomb songs. Well, I actually would like to be Carl McCoy. Um, <laughs> if I could somehow, <laughs> Uh, change like you know like how how you can possess like certain people like that'd be kind of cool I think but you know you mean the p possessor style but then you have to kill him off in the yeah after so that? I'm like exactly that's what I was <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking <laughs> but um... yeah I mean you know remember like uh, I mentioned one of my favorite uh, images my happy place is like my kill stealing stuff in the office and flipping everybody off. Um, <laughs> would be like you seeing you on stage in a poncho with sunglasses and a fucking sombrero playing tomb songs that, <laughs> that, would, that would be great um i, I would print a t-shirt not mike hill is hard to work with but like uh mike hill is a full-time cowboy now that'd be uh yeah we should do a that's something that we should do that well drew should do actually is uh put yeah. together a series of mike hill is hard to work with t-shirts yeah. <laughs> my Mike Hill is a hard cowboy. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Well thanks a lot. Uh you know, enjoy the rest of your weekend and uh we'll we'll, we'll be we'll be coming at you guys with something else cool in the next couple of weeks, man.
Ah! Uh-huh. 